Do you remember the first book that you loved? The first time that words on a page lit a spark in your imagination? When you first realised the power of a story and it was all yours because you could hold it and shape it in your own mind. When you read as a child or are read to as a child, I think that stuff goes into you in a way that perhaps later reading doesn't. The stories are usually fantastical, contemporary, interesting, and there's always hope at the end usually of children's stories. I think it allows children access to a whole range of emotions and skills and understanding that you don't get in other places. You can lose yourself in a book, but you can find yourself in a book. And I think that's very, very uplifting when you're young. Scotland has a more than reasonable claim to inventing modern children's literature. Take Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped or Treasure Island, Davy Balfour on the run across the wilds of Scotland, Jim Hawkins out on the high seas in search of lost gold. Were they the first young adult novels? I carried my father's letter and I wouldn't be kept it, but I couldn't help but you lose. Was this the palace I'd been coming to? The licht frae a fire flickered in the windies, but my ram stam chappin brocht ne response. Ebenezer Balfour, I hae something for ye. A war wi ye, this blunderbush is loaded. I carry a letter of introduction. My name is David Balfour. As your father did. Aye, he'll be dead, and yon'll be what brings ye chappin at my door. Gang ben the kitchen, and touch Nathan. For over 20 years as the publisher of HEQ, James Robertson has been adapting best-selling books into the Scots language. As a publisher and as a novelist, his work has always been inspired by the best of Scottish literary tradition. I think any writer who wants to engage a young readership needs to go back and look at what's been done before, by whom. And Robert Louis Stevenson, to me, is one of the reasons I think he's such a brilliant writer is because... In spite of the fact that his language now is becoming a little bit old-fashioned, it's still his books are still pretty accessible. And a book like Treasure Island, you almost immediately are engaged with that book because you almost become Jim Hawkins yourself because it's told by him and so you become the, the first person, the eye of the story. And Stevenson is so brilliant at showing that tale unfold through Jim Hawkins' eyes that, um, that you, you're almost seeing it yourself. And that, therefore, you become Jim Hawkins on the pirate ship on the island. You become him when they're fighting the pirates, uh, you know, from the stockade and so on. It's just a... Cla I mean, I'm thinking, talking about Treasure Island specifically, that is such a classic book, for uh, not just for children but for adults, because it, it shows you how an author can so immerse themselves in the story that they just naturally take the readers along with them. At the very beginning of the 20th century, another Scottish novelist introduced one of the best loved and most enduring characters to the world of children's literature. A boy from a faraway land who could never grow up. His origins can be found in the idyllic back garden of a Georgian house on the banks of the River Nith in the town of Dumfries. Moat Bray was the home of author J.M. Barry's childhood friend, and he first visited the house when he was 13. He later said that it was his experiences of playing in its garden late into the summer evenings, he called it an enchanted land, that inspired the adventures of Peter Pan, Wendy and the Lost Boys. Moat Bray is a two-part proposition, so there's the, the physical building and the garden in Dumfries, a beautiful Georgian house that's been uh, reimagined to let us kind of step into 1873 when Jamie Barry first arrived in Dumfries and started leading his pirate gang around the garden. We have uh, events celebrating the best of children's literature. We, we work a lot in the Scots language, which is obviously very strong in Dumfries and Galloway. And then we have a second function, uh, which is very new, and that's our ambition to be Scotland's national centre for children's books. How do we engage children with books 
to really make them into those readers who might become writers, who might become creators. So we're, we're experimenting and playing in partnership with local young people to find out kind of how we can continue to grow and deepen and enrich the programmes that, that we and others uh, deliver all across Scotland and indeed further afield. Peter Pan, to me, and of course there are many readings, but to me Peter Pan is a really deeply sad text and I can't help when I read it but to see through it in a way to that history of Barry's, the loss of his brother and his mother perhaps in a way that maybe today we would recognise as a bit Victorian, but finding her way to, to live with that loss by seeing comfort in the idea he would always be a boy. Peter Pan does all the things that, that great children's literature does it really fundamentally respects the reader, it has the magic, it has the fun, it has the sort of impishness, but also it has that real depth and that real understanding that these are foundational texts. As well as offering a physical connection to the origins of children's literature, Moat Bray is dedicated to nurturing a love of storytelling. This goes from young readers to established authors too. In 2020, Maisie Chan became Moat Bray's first writer in residence using her time to work both on her own craft and to break down barriers to what children's books are and who they can be for. I'm inspired by a lack of British Chinese authors. So I did live in America for a year and I saw that they had Asian American authors. And when I got back to Britain, I found that there was literally no authors that were British Chinese. I just found that there wasn't any books that reflected my reality there weren't characters that looked like me, and so I wanted to fill that void. So that was a huge thing for me to become a children's author. I get to sit at home and in cafes and write stories and come up with brilliant ideas that I couldn't really do in other jobs. So it's for me, it's one of the best jobs I've ever had. So I started writing Danny Chung when I moved to Scotland around six years ago, and I struggled actually to write a whole novel before I moved to Scotland. So I feel like Glasgow especially has a magical creative energy. There's musicians here. And I felt kind of a warm reception when I moved here. Scottish children's authors, I didn't know, took me for coffee and tea. I feel like I'm part of something new, but I've tapped into what has already been here in Scotland. I think children's literature is the bedrock of promoting empathy. I think children are, you know, it's a bit like Whitney Houston said, children are the future, it's a bit cliche. But I really believe that if we can write stories where we have disabled characters, neurodiverse characters, um, LGBT characters and characters of colour, that we can make the world a better place. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit cliche, but I really believe it. <laughs> Edinburgh-based Florist Books was originally founded in 1976, beginning its work around a kitchen table on the south side of the city. Today, it's grown to become the largest publisher of children's books in Scotland. Publishing is a creative industry, and the industry part is really important in that. Publishing is a business, and like all businesses, Floris needs to make sure that the numbers add up. Um, if they don't, we can't pay our staff, we can't pay the rent, we can't pay our creatives, our, our authors and our illustrators. So when we're deciding what to publish, as well as having really a kind of vigorous internal debate with lots of voices and perspectives, um, we are also um, thinking about b the business aspects of publishing. Is this book going to be financially profitable? Um, is there an audience for this book? And can we reach that audience? But alongside that, you're also thinking about things like, is this a book that we can get behind? Uh, is this a book that is going to bring something new for the children who read it? Um, is it going to open them up to a new experience or reflect something that they haven't seen before? Is it going to enhance their life? So I guess that's the kind of publishing that we're trying to do here at Floris. Tradition and heritage are hugely important. And one of the things that Floris does is try to make Scotland's heritage accessible for children now. And that might mean publishing collections of Scotland's folk and fairy tales. It might mean publishing picture books about key historical figures, Mary Queen of Scots or Robert the Bruce maybe. Also, it was really important for Scottish children to see their world and their reality reflected back at them in the books that they read. It's incredibly empowering and validating to see yourself in a story. And you also need a balance for, Scot for Scottish children or for any children of reflecting their own culture back at them, but also exposing them to stories from other people's experience. 
that balance is really important. Floris was the publisher of the 50th book in author Teresa Breslin's award-winning career. Throughout Teresa's writing, from novels and short stories to poetry and plays, she's always drawn inspiration, not just from the history of Scotland, but also from the very landscape itself. The Illustrated Legends of Scotland's Kings and Queens is my 50th book, so almost it was like the culmination of my life's work. It really was, I have to say that, because I'd written modern stories about Scotland at different times, historical stories. Then, for the last few years, I've been doing myths and legends. And to me, it just, the physicality of Scotland and how, you know, laws and everything have emerged, I just totally appealed to me. It was almost like, you know, I had been born to write the book and here, here it was happening. I think that one of the key components in a child's development is access to books. And it's my passionate belief that we need libraries. They're not an add-on to any other services. They are absolutely crucial. They're the heart of the school, the heart of a community. I love walking. Um, that's one of my hobbies, is walking, reading and walking. The landscape of Scotland, the city landscape, the, current, the mountains, the lochs, the rivers, the sea, hugely inspirational. When I walk out from my home and I walk towards the hills, they're never the same and, you know, the shadow goes across the hill. You can, sometimes you see heather, sometimes you see snow. The, the, the light, the constantly changing light, it's very, very inspirational. I find that a great inspiration. For Joan Haig, whose debut children's novel Tiger Skin Rug was nominated for a Carnegie Medal, all the varied strands of her personal history feed into her work. From growing up in Africa and the South Pacific to coming with her family to live in Scotland, she's become attuned to finding the threads of stories in everything around her. Living in Scotland has definitely impacted my writing. I think it's impossible in Scotland not to be inspired by the landscape. You get this real sense in Scotland that the landscape is, has layers to it um, and that if you just scratch the, the surface, you'll find a story and you'll find magic. And I think particularly if you're writing for children, that's a really um, powerful motivator um, because you're just surrounded by, by magic and story. More than that, I think it's also to do with the light in Scotland. So I grew up in the tropics where the day is bright and the night is dark and more or less that's, you know, it's very clear cut. Whereas in Scotland, the light is, is much more playful, it's much more eerie. Just that, that shifting light has a real quality to it that I think has definitely driven some of my writing. I think often in children's literature, stories start with something concrete like a house or a building or a school and the adventure goes from there so you open a door and magic is beyond or you know it could be a shop or um, a boarding school setting um, but there's often a building that sort of anchors the beginning of the story and we see this you know far back in history it's, a, it's sort of a tradition of writing and it's not one that's unique to Scotland but I think Scottish stories have this brilliant opportunity because the built environment in Scotland is so rich and historical, so you only have to look at a castle and there's a story there. So I think there is this strong connection between buildings and architecture and children's stories. Alistair Chisholm's young adult novels reach into the far future to explore distant stars and alien planets. Yet, even far beyond our world, faint echoes of the influence of Robert Louis Stevenson can still travel through space and time. When you're trying to set out to write uh, a children's story, one of the, the real plot issues that you've always got to deal with is how do you get these characters into these situations? Because they've got to be young, they've got to be somebody that the reader can associate with. So, so how on earth did the, 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 the adults let them out of their sight? So when you look back at, at things like uh, Kidnapped and uh, uh, Treasure Island and things like that, there's always a way in which a young character ends up in a scenario that, that really they should never be in in the first place. When I'm looking at um, my own stories, uh, I'm obviously 
thinking about that as well and uh, with the Ryan Lost, uh, it was how do I get these children, these modern children, into this situation where the, where the adults can't help but in a way that seems, that seems sort of plausible that the reader will, will go along with. To begin with, I usually have one scene which sticks in my head and then that goes on uh, from there on. So in the case of Orion Lost, I woke up with an idea in my head of somebody waking up on a spaceship completely deserted. She was wandering down the corridors. It was very echoey. There was nobody there. And she looked out of a portal. She was in the middle of deep space. And the voice behind her said, you have to save us. And from there on, I thought, I have to tell this story. And the rest of the story has to spread from there. So usually it's that one thing that then carries the theme of the book onwards. One of the absolutely brilliant things I think about uh, middle grade and YA fiction and even younger is the way in which over the last uh, couple of decades it's absolutely taken on the cause of diversity and representation. A new generation of young readers are actually going to be able to see themselves in these books, not as side characters or not at all, but, but actually it's the main characters going forward and I, I just think that's fantastic, it's really exciting. While it may still draw from the well of stories and techniques pioneered by the likes of Stevenson and Barry, children's literature today has grown far beyond its origins. And in capturing the hearts and minds of young readers from all backgrounds, it can create something far more important and magical than just joy and escapism. A love of books. A love which, just like that boy invented in a Dumfries back garden, will never grow old. The best thing that children's literature can do for its readers is to make them see the world through other people's eyes and open the world up to them in a variety of different ways. It can create strong, resilient, empathetic, inquisitive young people. It can empower them and I believe that it does and I believe that Scotland has a great heritage of doing that. It offers entertainment and escapism, it offers information and historical context, particularly for non-fiction, it offers empowerment and validation, but alongside that it offers perspective and empathy, and I think if children's publishing is done well, it can offer all those things. It can build empathy, it can allow us to see into other characters, and um, people who are not like us, uh, who are from different generations, from different backgrounds, from all these kind of things, and it can really make us see how we are connected. It can encourage children to explore who they are, who other people are. So a book should be a safe space for children to go to where they can really dig deep um, into big ideas um, and not feel afraid. Quite often, and I'm sure other writers of this experience, a teacher or a parent will say to you, he or she, they've, they've never read a book before. I, I couldn't get them to read, but your, your book did it. It's just such a, it's such a wonderful, you know, feeling for both the writer and the, and, and the reader. Literature goes across the world and so we can learn about different cultures, we can learn about people that we might not meet in everyday life. And so I think literature, and children's literature especially, is one of the best ways to promote diversity and inclusion, not just in the UK, but around the world.
If you'd like to see the authors featured in this film reading excerpts from their books, then click here.